Greetings all, this is Rick Levine with your February 2024 astrological forecast. Although it's a short month, we have a lot to cover, but before we get into it, I have a few announcements I like to make. And for those of you who find these tedious, well, move through them, but there's a few things that may be occurring in your area and things that you'd like to know about. So, first and foremost, if you're watching this either on the 1st or the 2nd of February, know that on Friday night, February 2nd, I will be back at Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond, Washington for Astrology Night. I, I missed a month because I was in India, but I am back home, and although India was a fantastic experience, I'm glad to be back, uh, back home in my office. Um, so if you uh, are listening to this after the fact and want to pick up on that it will be available on YouTube. It will be live streamed at on this channel. Uh, that's youtube.com slash at sign Rick Levine. And that'll be at 6.30 p.m. on Friday, February 2nd. And I will be addressing 2024. I'll be giving my year overview for the year ahead. So even if you're listening to this later on, you may want to go back and pick up the beginning of that and see what's up for the year. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the following Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I will be, and this is February 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, I will be at the Conscious Life Expo, which is at the LAX Hilton, Los Angeles Hilton, right near the airport, and uh, the opening will be on Friday. Um, I'll be involved in a number of events. I'll actually be playing the flute for part of the opening. Um, but on Saturday midday, I will uh, be on a panel uh, that will be the astrology panel. And then on Sunday afternoon, I will be um, again involved in a panel that will be George Norrie's panel. Um, but I will also be doing a workshop on Sunday afternoon at 6 p.m., Sunday late afternoon, early evening, entitled, It Ain't Your Grandma's Astrology, and this is all about astrology in the roaring 2020s and why astrology these days is different than astrology in the past. Then I will be doing a post-conference um, uh, workshop, uh, and that'll be on Monday, that'll be February 12th, I'll be doing a post-conference workshop, and that'll be entitled, and that'll be at 2 p.m. on Monday afternoon, entitled "Using Astrology to Improve Our Navigational Skills on Our Earthly Adventures." And this is all about how how do we go about making better choices, especially um, in these times. So that is February. The next event, I just want to mention a couple of these in passing, really quickly. I will be back at, I say back at, I haven't been there for a number of years, but I'll be back at the Tucson Astrologers Guild in mid-May. That's May 10th and 11th, and I'll have more information on that in the in the uh, months ahead. Um, but uh, the Friday night talk will be open to the public. Saturday um, will be on the Art of Astrological Consultation, taking it to the next level. That'll be a Saturday afternoon workshop. Um, then the end of May, May 23rd through the 27th, is the 40th. I can't believe it's the 40th annual NORWAC. That's the Northwest Astrology Conference. Um, I think this is my 34th Norwac that I've attended. Um, I will be doing two lectures on the program and a post-conference workshop. Uh, the lectures that I'll be doing will be Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon. Um, one of them will be more of a beginner, but an overview lecture on, on um, how the planets make the signs come alive. And on Sunday, I'll be doing a talk on overcoming the patriarchal biases in natal astrology uh, interpretation. And I think that'll be a very interesting talk. On Monday, my post-conference is hands-on natal interpretation, and it's really on just how do we get to the core of the matter um, in a consultation and what can we do um, in a consultation. And this is the work that I really, really love. 
Um, then coming up in mid-June, I will be back at Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York, and I will be there with um, Maurice Fernandez, Lynn Bell, uh, Amir Bey, um, and Linda Tucker, oh, and Valerie Weir. Um, the thing is, Linda Tucker is the, um, is the white lion uh, woman from South Africa, um, and we are going to be talking about uh, how the age of Aquarius is really part of a polarity um, to the age of Leo. And of course, we're not in the age of Aquarius yet, but with Pluto moved into Aquarius, it's on everyone's mind. And, um, and this is going to be a really interesting uh, weekend because we're going to be looking at the visionary mystical art of astrology, and we're going to have some information from Linda, who is the keeper of the sacred white lion tradition, and we're going to explore um, this paradigm of the Leo-Aquarius axis, and I think this will be a very fascinating and interesting weekend. I'm looking forward to it, um, and, and that is the weekend of June 7th, 8th, and 9th. Register for that now while there's still room. The following weekend on June 15th, I'll be up at Boston again at the NCGR. Um, more information to follow on, on that. And although there are several other things coming up later in the year, uh, we have time for that. But I do want to mention in passing that I will be doing another initiation into astrology in Goa, India. And that has already been scheduled. Um, there'll be information appearing on that in the weeks ahead. And that will be November 23rd to December 4th. And of course, that's such a major trip for many people. It's not too early to start thinking about that, especially for for so many of you that really wanted to go last year and couldn't quite get it together for it or had reasons why you were going to put it off. But um, we will be back at the same place. I will have a lot more information on that. Um, it was a magical and amazing event. Uh, registration will be limited for that. And uh, watch this space for more information as it becomes available. Um, I'll also be speaking at the OPA conference in October and at the AA conference in, um, in England, in the UK, uh, in uh, the end of August, beginning of September. More information on those to come also. So that's it. I have a busy year ahead, and I'm looking forward to including many of you in it. Of course, my thanks always goes to, the, um, to those of you who are Patreon subscribers. If you're not a Patreon subscriber and want to find out more, go to patreon.com forward slash Rick Levine and see what else is available aside from these free monthly um, forecasts that that many of you get. Um, there's a variety of levels of involvement that you can um, subscribe to. Um, also, if you're not on my mailing list, get on the mailing list. You can go uh, to www.ricklevineastrologer.com and sign up for the mailing list. That way you'll be kept informed of other things going on and get occasional updates and links to other things that are not included here. Um, that's ricklevineastrologer.com. And of course, I'm always forgetful about this, but it never hurts to click the subscribe and the notify buttons uh, below so that you know when I post on YouTube. Okay, that's it. Thanks for the uh, uh, attention and in in, in your uh, indulging me and allowing me to share these things with you, but it is my way of keeping you up to date on what it is that I'm doing because many of you are interested. So, here we are at the beginning of February. We're through the first month of the year 2024. As I mentioned earlier, I will be doing an overview of 2024 um, uh, at the Astrology Night on February 2nd at Soul Food Coffee House. And for those of you who are watching this after the fact, that will be available for you on YouTube uh, on this channel. So, here we are at the beginning of February, and, you know, for months I've been talking about, I feel like I've been saying the same thing again and again and again, and that is since last, geez, I don't know, August, September, October, November, even December, 
I've been talking about by the end of January 2024, which we are now past because we are technically at the beginning of February, although I am recording this on the um, evening of uh, the 30th of January. But as we open up February, uh, all the planets are moving direct. And this is the first time that we've been experiencing this in quite a while. And for months, I've been talking about how when we get to the end of January, once Uranus makes its direct station, and as it begins to pick up speed uh, through the month of February, as are the other planets that have recently turned from retrograde to direct, including Jupiter and Chiron, and for that matter, even um, uh, Neptune and going back a couple of months, Saturn and Pluto both moving direct, Pluto now moving into Aquarius where it'll stay for most of the year, and Saturn really picking up speed um, as it's now, uh, we open the month with it at six and a half degrees of Pisces back where it was last uh, April, uh, late March and April, and so we really find ourselves now on the precipice of the future that for some reason, in some crazy way, has been kind of, we've been avoiding it, or it's been avoiding us. Uh, there's no question now, things are going to pick up, and even though thing, the pace of things are going to pick up, and even though it feels like there's been a lot going on, the fundamental issues have been rather immovable. And although it may take through much of this year to really clear ourselves of whatever it is that has been going on um, since really 2020, um, I, I, we, we are now kind of on that launch pad. And one of the pieces that I want to talk about just before we start looking at charts is the fact that um, Jupiter made a conjunction with Saturn as it does about every 20 years, Jupiter and Saturn align, and they did last uh, around Christmas of 2020. And that Jupiter-Saturn conjunction um, uh, uh, in December of 2020 was even more significant than other Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions because um, that was a great mutation. It was part of uh, the Jupiter-Saturn changing elements, and I don't want to get too deeply into that. But at the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, it sets the seed for the next 10 years of outward expansion till the opposition, which will be in 2029, 30, 31. That opposition is going to actually occur exactly five times between December of 2029 and October of December, um, October of uh, 2031. But last summer, Jupiter and Saturn reached a sextile phase that they're technically still in, but they're not exact. You see, as, as the planets went retrograde, um, they came very, very close. The planets, meaning all of them, but in particular Jupiter and Saturn, um, that Jupiter and Saturn came very close to the retrograde that they formed last mid-June, June 19th, 20th was their exact sextile. And when Jupiter and Saturn sextile, that's a time when, when there's fundamental connection between uh, the growth, Jupiter, and holding the status quo. And the seed was planted back in 2020 at the conjunction, and much of 2024 into 2025 will actually be about the Jupiter-Saturn square, which is the developmental phase of this opening square, is the developmental phase when that which began to occur back at the conjunction, again, that would have been 2020, now reaches a point of either go or no go. It's um, Dane Rudyard called the opening square, is in particular, of the moon, but the opening square is a crisis of action or a crisis in action. We begin things around the conjunction, that would have been back around 2020, and then as we reach the sextile, there's kind of like this opportunity to make the two of them work together in some way. And through the month of February, Jupiter and Saturn come within a degree. It's a, it's a sextile that's partile. They're in the same degree number, but they don't actually perfect. They perfected last year 
in June of 2023. And although they get close now, um, this month, they do not become exact. And this is really significant because as we progress through this year and move into March, April, May, by the time we get to June, July, and August, by August, they're actually making a square because Jupiter's moving really fast now. And, and as that square begins to unfold in, um, in early summer and then through the middle of summer, that square actually occurs three times. It occurs August 19th, 2024. It occurs again at the end of the year, um, right? Actually, Christmas Eve day uh, on December 24th. And then it occurs the third and final time next June. Now, the reason why this is so significant is that we have an opportunity now while we're working with the sextile to figure out ways to get these two ends of the spectrum, the Jupiter, the expansion, the opening, the opportunity, and Saturn, the restriction, the conservative, um, the, the holding back, the stability, these two energies, the breathing in and the breathing out, the, the blowing up of the balloon and the not blowing it up too far until it pops. This is Jupiter and Saturn, um, what I often call peristalsis, the expansion and contraction of growth. And we have an opportunity in February to work with that opportunity, uh, to work with the potential of cooperating between these two opposite forces of expansion and contraction, which by the time we get to early midsummer and especially on through election day in the United States and then on even through um, the Christmas holidays and then through inauguration of the new president, these conflicts are going to be back upon us again. But it's going to be a go, no go um, gateway that then allows us to move into the future. And I think that we're going to see more and more of this. Um, and, and February is really important because we can feel the movement forward and we have an opportunity to work with these energies. I'll say more about that as we get going. The other most important thing about February, and I mentioned this earlier, is that there are no planets that are moving retrograde. And so all the planets, even including Mercury, um, uh, which had been retrograde all the way up to the beginning of the year, um, th you know, through December up through the beginning of, of, uh, of uh, January of 2024, Mercury has now gained speed and is kind of moving very quickly again. Uh, we actually have Mercury catching up with the sun later this month. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we have kind of almost what's like a like a triple Kazemi, and a Kazemi uh, that's the Arabic word for in the heart, um, the heart of the sun or in the center um, of it. And when a planet lines up with the sun exactly, it's considered to be almost like having its superpower. And so Mercury has its its conjunction or its Kazemi um, with the sun on February twenty eighth just a few hours before um, before Saturn does the same. And so we have this kind of triple conjunction of the Sun and Saturn and Mercury. We'll have more to say that at the, in a bit. Um, and that's at the end of the month. And this is going to be a very potent eye of a needle through which we will pass before we can move into March that really does say, oops, we're on the other side of something. What that something is isn't quite clear yet. And I think it's really important to put that into uh, context and we'll be obviously revisiting that when we talk about uh, the March uh, forecast um, of one month from, from now. So let's come back to February 1st and, and, and look at some charts, take a look at some of the most important events of, of the month. Um, we do have some very interesting things happening this month and some things that tie into other events that are already unfolding. But I think it's important to understand that because the outer planets are still gaining speed, having been retrograde, that we don't have any outer planet to outer planet um, aspects. Um, when we are looking at the actual aspects between the planets themselves, we have a lot of mercurial energy, we have um, a fair amount of Venus transits. 
We even have a bunch of Mars transits, but we don't have any Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto transits to one another. Now, what this does suggest is that there's no specific concrete events that that happen that are so strong that redefine where we're coming from or where we're going to. However, the faster moving planets, because they are moving into new territory now or moving forward, and, and some of them moving into new territory, because of that, there's still going to be a fair amount of events occurring. But the events that occur are going to um, resonate or re-stimulate events that are already um, set, that are already established from, from, from the past. And we'll see how that plays out in just a few minutes. So looking at the chart of February 1st, and of course, as I always say here, we're looking at, a, we're looking at noon charts, and what that means is that sometimes when I'm talking about an aspect, it may not have occurred yet, it may occur later in the day, but we're looking at charts for noon in uh, Redmond, Washington, where I am, which is Pacific Standard Time, so you need to adjust your time zones accordingly. Uh, in fact, we use an Aries rising chart because the ascendant shows where the horizon is. Where my horizon is here in Redmond is not necessarily important to you if you're in New York or in Paris or in Sydney or wherever you may be around the planet. And so I'm not looking at any, hor um, any ascendants or any houses here at all. Um, however, at noon on February 1st, Pacific time, the moon is at 29 degrees and 41 minutes of Libra, which means that when you adjust for your time zone, the moon will be at that point um, uh, for all of us simultaneously. I think the thing to understand that as we begin the month is that we're getting a day or two of, of a bit of discomfort, and yet we are on the edge of some movement. The discomfort that we're getting is that the moon, as it moves from, Scor from, from Libra into Scorpio, which it does at 12.36 p.m. Pacific time, um, as it does that, it will then square um, Pluto, which is just moved into Aquarius. So it'll basically pick up on that square to Pluto, which is um, a kind of a reinstigation of some of these energies that are really deep, the unconscious, the shadow. We have a lot of Pluto stuff to deal with this month as we have planets making the first aspects to Pluto. Since Pluto's been in Aquarius, we're going to talk about them um, in a few moments, including Mercury's conjunction with Pluto in Aquarius on February 5th, and then Mars's conjunction with Pluto on February 13th, and then Venus's conjunction with Pluto um, on, um, on uh, February 17th. All of these are significant um, because of Pluto's role of what's going on, and this is new territory. And of course, you ne we need to remember that it was Mars squaring Pluto, Mars when it was at 29 degrees, or actually really more like 28 degrees, I believe, of Libra as it was squaring um, Pluto on October 7th of 2023, that Mars squaring Pluto was the um, um, eruption of the um, situation, uh, the ongoing unfolding complexity of the situation um, in uh, Israel and uh, Palestine and with uh, the Israeli government and, the, and Hamas. And so this is all very significant because in February, we're seeing this energy stirred up. And even on February 1st, when the moon moves into, uh, into uh, Scorpio, um, it's going to make a square to Pluto, it doesn't last very long because lunar squares don't, or lunar aspects don't last long at all. But it's important also that on February 1st, we have Mars making a half square with Saturn. And this is very much a um, problematic 
uh, relationship between two pro- planets that have a problematic relationship because Mars says yes and Saturn says no. Mars says do it, Saturn says hold back. Mars says hot, Saturn says cold. Mars says impulse, Saturn says follow through, compulse. Is that a word? Compulse? Compulsion. All right. So we have this half square between Saturn and Mars, and I think the the tension between how we push forward, and Mars is in Capricorn, and when Mars is pushing forward in Capricorn, it wants to get to where it's going. It's not like a Mars in Aries that's hot under the collar and then it kind of blows it off and that's it. So there's some really some real intensity going on here. And this is confused a bit by the fact that Mercury um, is, uh, a, is, is approaching a sextile to Neptune. Let's move this ahead a day, and we can see that, um, that M- Mercury at 26 degrees of, um, of Capricorn um, here is just past its sextile to Neptune, which is at almost 26 degrees of Pisces. The exact sextile occurs really about 3 a.m. on February 2nd Pacific time. But this means that there's some some lies being told or some confusion, some uncertainty. Um, We have to be careful about what we accept to believe because we're not being told the truth. Now, obviously, this is a state of what's been going on for, maybe for eons, but certainly since Neptune's been in Pisces, and also certainly even more um, since Saturn has doubled down as it's trying to make sense um, out of being in Pisces and will be for the next couple of years still. By February 3rd, we have um, the moon moving out of Scorpio into Sagittarius. It does that very late in the evening uh, at 10.27 p.m. But the other thing that's important here is that um, is that by, um, by the 4th, we can see here that on the 3rd, Mercury is at 27 degrees and 53 minutes of Aquari- of, of, of Capricorn, which means that Mercury is just about ready to go into um, Aquarius. And if we move this ahead, um, we can see that the moon is now on the 4th. The moon is in Sagittarius. And Mercury on the 4th midday is at 29 degrees and 25 minutes. It moves into Aquarius by 9 o'clock, 9, 10 p.m. actually. And this is a shift of energy. I think we can actually feel this energy on the 4th and on into the 5th, not only with the moon going into Sagittarius where there's some hope, the moon does square Saturn, so it may feel like the hope is a little bit overinflated. It may feel like our hopes are being dashed on some level, but still that moon in in Sagittarius does, it does encourage us to think about the potential and about the possibility. But then when Mercury moves into Aquarius, it's almost like our mind is freed up from being restrained by only seeing things through the way that we follow the trajectory of where we've been, where we are, and where that leads us. Mercury in Capricorn is linear, but when Mercury gets into Aquarius, it can go quantum. It can go like like the zigzag of lightning striking. It it it, it basically can become a bit more erratic, and that and that erratic energy can be brilliant as as the light bulb goes off and we begin to see new ways of of, of approaching things. And what's so important here is that once Mercury moves into Aquarius, I'm going to move this ahead to the 5th, once Mercury moves into Aquarius... Um, by um, on on the fifth, Mercury will also um, join up with Pluto, and this is the first time that there is a planetary conjunction with Pluto while 
Pluto is in Aquarius, where it's going to be for the next couple of decades. So this is a significant event, and it's especially significant because there's a very profound and deep relationship between Mercury and Pluto that we need to talk about to understand what's happening in February. And that relationship between Pluto and 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 Mercury has to do with Mercury's role as the psychopomp. Uh, th- a psychopomp is basically um, a deity that guides souls on their journeys into the underworld. And we norm- normally think, or many of us think of Mercury as the trickster, and Mercury as clever, and Mercury as witty, and Mercury as lighthearted. But that's only one side of Mercury. Remember, Mercury is dualistic. Um, even in its gender, Mercury is, um, is, 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 is dualistic. It's not, it's, it's not neither male nor female. Mercury is, is both male, female. It's, it, it's a herma- hermaphrodite. And Mercury in Aquarius, even in its own raw energy, is futuristic and brilliant and breaks out of the constraints that it had while it was in Capricorn. But Mercury, as the psychopomp, goes into the underworld. Remember, when Persephone was abducted by Pluto, or Proserpina abducted by Hades, if you want to use the Greek. Now remember, um, Proserpina or Persephone was the daughter of Demeter or Ceres, Latin and Greek, for the goddess of the fruit of the grain of the earth, of 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 the fruit of the earth. And because Jupiter couldn't go into the underworld, Jupiter sent Mercury because Mercury could seamlessly go back and forth across the river Styx um, into the realms of, of the underworld. And therefore, Mercury worked out the deal that basically allowed Persephone um, to come up into, the, um, into this world for half the year and then return as queen of the underworld to be with the ultimate bad boy, Pluto. Um, now, here's the deal. Pluto, which we consider to be the, the, the lord of the hell realms, the, the, um, the shadow, um, the, the intensity of the depth, that, the volatility of what happens after death and before birth, birth, all of these things are true. But it's also important to understand that Pluto, as the underworld, as the shadow, that which is unknown, that which is hidden, Pluto is the unconscious. And in fact, Mercury, which is language and communication, Mercury conjoining Pluto is basically a symbol for what we call talk therapy. Why do I say that? Because it took Mercury to go into the unconscious so that we could shine the light of of consciousness, of the sun, onto Pluto and bring things out into the open. And when things are brought out into the open, then we get to talk about them. So I think it's very significant that by February 5th, when Mercury moves into, uh, it actually moves into Aquarius very late on the 4th, at least on the West Coast of the United States. But by the 5th, Mercury is aligned with Pluto and it's allowing voice to be given to that which was hidden. And remember, we're going back to Mars's square to Pluto back on October 7th um, of 2023 as kind of an important event in understanding some of the things that may be b- brought to light at this point in time. We'll come back to that in just a moment, but I think here we're really seeing um, the communication of those things which have been hidden and have been kept under, under wraps. Granted, Mercury lines up with Pluto once once a year, but this is the first time Mercury has lined up with Pluto in Aquarius in pff, close to 230, so 220 some odd years. All right. By the 6th, early in the morning, the moon moves from Sagittarius into Capricorn. We're now getting another wave of the seriousness. Um, Also, during this time on the 6th, um, we have... 
um, Venus and the Sun. Um, it's it's interesting because Venus and the Sun are both at about 16, 17 degrees through these days. And on the 5th, both Venus and the Sun aspected Chiron. Venus squared Chiron and, and the Sun sextiled Chiron, bringing the healing element into, um, into view. And, and here it's an also important to, to note that throughout this month, Chiron is tracking the nodal axis very, very closely. Um, it, it, we get to the exact conjunction of Chiron and the North Node uh, later in the month, and it depends on whether we use the True Node or the Mean Node. Um, I normally map the True Node um, and the exact conjunction of Chiron and the North Node occurs on February 19th or 20th, but you can see here on the 6th it's already within a degree and a quarter, almost within a degree and a half of being conjoined. If you use the mean node, that exact conjunction doesn't happen until March 4th, and um, whichever node you know node point you use doesn't matter to me. The, there's obviously some sloppiness, and you know, and and everyone can't be right, or maybe we both can be right in a quantum world um, where the uh, true node and mean node can differ by a couple of degrees. All right. Anyhow, we have this sense of the healing aspect of of our w what we've inherited from the past. Um, this whole idea of the world and that we're born into um, is linked to the destiny of, of others. Um, it's in Aries, and there's something new here about this, but, but we're confronted by that which limits our, our healing and, um, and or the healing in relationship to the greater whole, to the, uh, to the, to the deeper process, the nodal axis. And so on the fifth, when we have both Venus and the Sun um, um, forming aspects with Chiron, Venus squaring it, saying this is uncomfortable, but the Sun sextiling Chiron, saying yes, but if we face our discomfort, we actually can create some healing. This is significant, and, th and that's exact um, on the 5th. But by the time we get to the 6th, Venus and the Sun are both squaring and sextiling the node because the node and Chiron are so close together. So we're really looking at a few days here from the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, where we can kind of face some issues, even if they're uncomfortable, and really may be able to make some progress um, with, uh, again, shining the light, the Sun, illuminating that which we can then talk about. That would be the Mercury um, conjoining Pluto. This is a very, very interesting few days. This, in fact, brings us to um, the seventh, which has been building for a couple of days also, and that is that by the seventh, we have Venus making an exact trine with, with Uranus. Now, we had the end of um, uh, January, we had um, um, Mars making that trine to Uranus. Going back to last month, we had the Sun and, and Mercury making trines to Uranus. Uranus has been the, in the equation, and there's these this constant rippling of things coming to us that we hadn't expected that were like surprises. And the Venus trine Uranus is an attraction to that which would surprise us, that which is out of the box. Um, I think this is very important because you know, theoretically, this is this is we love something that's new. But that's just theoretically, because in practice, there are many of us that really are confronted by something that's new, and it shuts us down. We don't want new. We don't want different. We don't want to be upset. We don't want the status quo to be threatened. And I think that this Venus trine Uranus on, on February 7th actually um, can threaten the status quo, and it does it kind of in a sneaky way. Why do I say that? Well, because Mars on the 7th is also forming a sextile with Neptune. Now, remember, Mars, Neptune together is kind of like, it, it, it's the magician. It's the stage magic. It's the real magic where things are not what they appear to be. And so there's something going on here is that we can be very... Um, 
entranced, um, um, uh, distracted, even by something that seems so amazing and so cool, but it might not be what's real. We have to be careful here because something is coming out into the open. And again, while Mars is um, making this smooth sextile to Neptune, saying if we're open to the magic, something important can happen. Venus is trining Uranus, saying the lightning is striking, and we can, if we can allow ourselves to entertain the idea and and allow ourselves to to just even think about it, whether we act on it or not, this is something that can help open up what we need to open up. And the more we can do that, the better, because by the 8th, the sun is now squaring Uranus. And this is more electric. I mean, it, it's like it's being set up and we can feel it coming. But there's something here that happens that's like a bolt of, of lightning. It's like the 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 um strike from the unknown from out of the blue the lights go on this is on february um uh, 8th early in the morning we're going to be feeling it already you know on the 7th um and by the 8th it's going to be electric and early in the morning on the 8th the moon moves into aquarius and of course that means that the moon lines up with the moon will actually um on the on the 7th um and 8th the moon will go across venus and Mars and Capricorn move into Aquarius, line up with Pluto, um, and we're moving toward the the new moon, um, which is uh, tomorrow on the 9th at 2.59 p.m. Pacific time. We'll get there in a moment, but, but it's like the energy is really... Um, you know, it's like before a storm, we can feel that there's electricity in the air. You know, the, the insects are buzzing. It's almost like the positive ionization that occurs just before an electrical storm. It doesn't feel good, but it feels like something's going to happen. And that's what's going on on the 7th and 8th, because something is going to happen. And as the moon moves into Aquarius um, and lines up with Pluto, it begins to the, the, the crackle, the energy begins to, to buzz, um, and the lightning begins to strike. And the actual new moon itself that occurs at 2.59 p.m. Um, on the 9th, um, which it, it occurs um, at 20, almost 21 degrees um, of Aquarius, um, is, is incredibly potent because that new moon will actually have just squared Uranus like the sun did the, pri the day before on the 8th. And so we're getting this energy of Uranus being the new. Uranus and Taurus, I don't want to change unless I have to because it's Taurus, which is holding one's position. I don't want to change unless I have to, but once I do, everything changes all at once. And so I think that we're in for um, some very interesting surprises that may unfold rather quickly um, in these first week and a, in this first week and a half of February. And by and, and this new moon is incredibly potent because of the new moon's square to Uranus, and also because we have Mercury coming into a square to Jupiter. Now, got to say a few words about Jupiter and Uranus together because um, Jupiter and Uranus are both in Taurus and through February, March, and April, because Jupiter picks up speed incredibly fast, that Jupiter and Uranus will actually reach a conjunction in April. And this is maybe one of the most significant gates of 2020, uh, <laughs> of 2024. Um, this is one of the most significant gates of 2024, because it's it basically says we have now moved through whatever it was that was holding us back. There's a there's a breakthrough and we're now pushed into the future. However, they're in Taurus. 
And so neither Jupiter nor Uranus in Taurus wants to move very fast because it wants to, it wants to be determined. It wants to make sure that it's going to get to where it's going. But as this new moon squares Uranus, the sudden breakthrough, and Mercury is squaring Jupiter, and that Mercury square, um, square Jupiter is exact on the 10th. Let's move this forward to the 10th. Um, as Mercury squares Jupiter on the 10th, by the way, the moon moves into Pisces also on the morning of the 10th. But it's now like we can be over enthusiastic. We can overdo. We can, we, we, whatever the breakthrough is that's occurred, we may react in a way that is inflated or exaggerated, whether we're reacting um, consistently with what we're learning or whether we're overreacting, try to suppress what we uh, are learning. Either way, that Mercury square Jupiter can just come on too strong. But the moon's move into Pisces, I think, helps settle the energy a little bit because then the moon later in the day on the 10th will actually catch up with Saturn and kind of hold that energy back. But the other thing that's occurring on the 10th is also that Venus is making a half square with Saturn, and this also is a bit suppressive. It's basically giving us a bit of a serious side to whatever it is that, that we think is happening. We want things to move really quickly, and yet that Venus semi-square Saturn is going to hold things back a bit. And and again, because it seems that Venus and um, it seems that Saturn and Neptune have been playing together because they're both in Pisces, as have Jupiter and Uranus have been playing together because they're both in Taurus. What's interesting is that on the 10th, we have the difficulty of Venus making a half square with Saturn saying, I'm not as excited about what I thought was going to happen and something's holding me back. And at the same time, by the 11th, Mercury makes a half square with Neptune. And that half square with Neptune basically goes back to this ability to, to distort the facts, to, to, to shake things up by going off into fantasy realm, which is not a problem unless you realize, unless you don't realize that it's a fantasy. So this Mercury half square Neptune, I think, will be confusing to things. Um, and and again, I think that there's a bit of uncertainty that creeps back into whatever it is we thought we learned over the last few days. By the, the and that's on the 11th where Mercury makes that exact half square with Neptune. By the morning of the 12th, the moon, having moved through Pisces, enters Aries at 5.25 a.m., and this is like resetting the emotional clock. And this is, is kind of doubled down cosmically by the fact that Mars, um, if we're looking at the chart of noon on February 12th, we can see that Mars is at 29 degrees and 40 some odd minutes of, of Capricorn. Mars is, is very close to, um, to Pluto. I talked about this earlier, but that exact Mars-Pluto conjunction occurs on the 13th, but it is actually um, uh, late on the 12th at 10.05 p.m., Mars actually enters Aquarius, and we can see already here at noon how close Mars is to Pluto. It's uh, about a degree away, um, and, and, and yet at the same time, we have this Mars approaching its conjunction with Pluto while we have now Venus approaching a sextile with Neptune. <laughs> now, the Venus-Neptune again brings up the fantasy issue. It brings up the what we can learn if we soften our energy and in some way entertain possibilities instead of entertaining only certainty. The pro One of the problems with Mars conjuncting Pluto, which is exact on the 13th, I'm going to move this ahead now to the 13th, one of the problems with Mars conjuncting Pluto 
is that these are two hard planets, Mars and Pluto. In fact, you know, Mars as the traditional ruler of Scorpio um, in the nighttime and Pluto as the, you know, the lord of the darkness and the night and the modern ruler of, of Scorpio. When Mars and Pluto get together, this is a rather difficult energy. And again, I need to point out that, the, that Mars was square Pluto in absolute and dynamic conflict back on October 7th. And so on whatever it is that unfolds here, in the middle of February, as Mars, as, as first, we have first Mercury um, moving into Aquarius and lining up with um, Pluto. In fact, at the beginning, we have the moon moving into um, uh, its square uh, to, uh, uh, to, to Pluto on February 1st. But by the 13th, we have Mars actually uh, conjoining Pluto by late in the evening, by 10.05 p.m., but this is this is a powerful enough aspect that we're not waiting for it to be exact. Something's going on, especially with the moon moving through impulsive Aries, and by um, midday, the moon is actually already, actually by mid-morning, the moon is already conjoining Chiron and the nodal axis, and so the moon moving through Aries is already stirring up that energy that's been stirring up these old past wounds that just won't don't cure. You know, it doesn't matter how many times um, you put a salve on a wound that is festering from underneath. And in a way, this is indicative of that kind of a wound. It needs to be dealt with as f from within, from underneath. If Mars conjoining Pluto says anything, it says suppression of the anger, of the rage, of the resistance, of the hostility, of the darkness, of, of the death, whatever that Mars-Pluto is, that, that that's not cured by just patching up things on the top. It can't be. It won't be. And it takes real courage and real, um, what's the word I'm looking for, determination to get beneath the surface. And that's what's required here. Now, whether we can muster that up, um, I, unfortunately, we don't have a good track record, but we have another opportunity here to do that. And, and again, I would say it's incumbent on every single person on the planet to do their own individual work on this, because nothing is going to cure socially unless we actually heal our own wounds individually and internally. By the 14th, we have the moon moving from Aries um, into Taurus. It does that at 7 a.m., 7.02 a.m., actually. We also have Mercury now making its sextile with Chiron and the node. And again, this is about talking about it. This is about we have to find a way to communicate. If we can't talk about it, we're not going to solve anything. And, um, and, and this is incredibly potent, incredibly important, um, because we do have an opportunity as the moon moves over Jupiter and through Taurus to take those determined steps and to find a way to be okay with the changes that are unfolding. By the and the, and, and that um, Mercury sextile um, Chiron and the node occurs on the fifteenth. By the sixteenth, we have Venus moving into Aquarius. Now, once again, we have the third planet this month. We, you know, th this began with Mercury joining, moving into Aquarius on the fourth, and joining up with Pluto on the fifth, and then with Mars moving into Aquarius on, on the twelfth, and joining up with Pluto on the thirteenth, and now we have Venus moving into Aquarius on the sixteenth, and joining up with Pluto on the seventeenth, and once again we're getting these waves of 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 what the changes ahead may be as we look at Pluto kind of getting its, its legs, you know, in these realms of the futuristic uh, Aquarius where, where it's about the collective, not about the individual. And it's about kind of resolving the energies by going to some higher conceptual place and making the breakthroughs that are necessary in order to resolve um, uh, the tension. 
Remember, that's what Uranus does. Uranus's job is to resolve tensions, and we also have um, now the inner planets, starting with Mercury, making squares to Uranus, and we'll see the others coming through that same point in the um, days and weeks ahead. But here on the 16th, we have Venus moving into Aquarius and lining up with Pluto on the 17th. At the same time, we have Mercury making that square to Uranus. So this is, again, it's about it's about the mental intellectual breakthroughs, but it's also about saying something that we may regret. It may be about saying things that, that come out in a way that we don't intend, um, especially because we have the moon still moving through Gemini. The moon entered Gemini um, midday, actually 11.39 a.m. Um, on um, Friday the 16th. Um, And as the moon is moving through Gemini, it's going to trine Venus and Pluto and Mars and Mercury and the sun before it moves into Cancer um, on Sunday the 18th. And in the interim, Venus is going to line up with Pluto. And so I think we're getting a chance to talk about things. And with Mercury squaring Uranus, we may be surprised by what we say We may be surprised by what someone else says. We may be surprised by what the dialogues are that are coming out in the open. Now, I understand this is over a weekend, so it'll be interesting to see how this all unfolds. But as Venus lines up with Pluto on the 16th, um, that's Friday and Saturday, the 17th, It's like we're not interested in the surface stuff. We're interested in going deep. That Pluto lining up with Venus in some ways is reminiscent of Persephone being abducted into the underworld. It's going to that deep, dark place where the transformation can occur. And we'll notice here that Venus is also slowly gaining on Mars. Um, Venus and Mars have been traveling kind of at similar speeds, but but Venus does travel and is traveling faster than Mars, and um, and Venus will actually um, catch up with um, with 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 Mars. Um, and it does that um, on the, on the uh, 21st. But here on the 17th, on Saturday the 17th, we can see that we have the um, Pluto and Venus and Mars and even Mercury and the Sun all in Aquarius. And the Moon is running through trines to all of those planets, giving us a sense and a taste of what's ahead. That is the 17th. By the 18th on Sunday, the moon moves into Cancer. It doesn't do it until the evening. It does it exactly at 7.24 p.m. Um, but um, just an hour later, actually by about 8.15, 8, 8.13 p.m., um, the sun moves out of Aquarius into Pisces. And so I'm going to zap this ahead to the 19th so we can see now that by the 19th, we are beginning to leave the intellectual, emotionally detached realm of Aquarius and move into a more emotional, into a more um, feeling realm with the moon moving through uh, emotional cancer and the sun now moving into Pisces. But remember that over the first week, the sun, as it moves through Pisces, will catch up to um, um, Saturn. And and what's really intriguing about the sun-Saturn conjunction is that at the same time, Mercury, which is moving rather quickly, Mercury will leave Aquarius, move into Pisces, and it will catch up with the sun and Saturn. So we have this triple conjunction that happens on the 28th that we'll get to in just a moment. And this is an incredibly potent and powerful um, a culmination um, of the month of February that I mentioned during the opening that really does also get to, I think, the gate that we won't be able to go back through. It's that eye of the needle that once we're through it, we're on the other side, whatever that means. But but here we are still on, on the um, 19th, 
And again, depending upon whether you're using the true node or the mean node, Chiron now has actually caught up with um, with the nodal axis, which is deepening the intensity of this environmental, circumstantial, cultural um, wound that we're trying to heal. And, and it may not be easy, but we have some potential in being able to do it because the moon moving through cancer, even though it kind of wants to hold on to the past, it's doing it in a way that is trining Saturn that can actually, I think, um, with, um, with, with, with Jupiter kind of at the midpoint. Because remember, at the very beginning, I talked about this sextile between Jupiter and Saturn that's never, it doesn't reach perfection, but this is about as close as it gets. It, it's partile. Well, it's not, it's not quite partile. It's within a degree. It's one degree apart that Jupiter to Saturn by the time we get here. And I think that we have an opportunity to, in some way, to heal these old wounds, even though it's not going to be an easy, an easy task. Um, as we come up to the 20th, the sun now makes a half square with um, Chiron. Um, and, and this, again, is kind of like an awareness that healing is not necessarily the easy path, even if it's the path that makes the most sense. On the 21st, the moon enters Leo. It, um, it does that um, early in the morning at 5.40 a.m. Pacific time. And notice how close here we are getting to the conjunction between Venus and Mars. They are now partile conjunct, meaning they're both at the same degree, at six degrees. But that conjunction is not until tomorrow. Um, no, it, it, it is actually at noon on the 21st. I'm sorry. Um, so the moon moves into Leo and we have that Venus-Mars conjunction in Aquarius. They're still close enough to Pluto to matter. Um, but the other thing that's occurring now is that we're beginning this little exodus from intellectual conceptual Aquarius into emotional Pisces. And we can see that on the 21st, we have Mercury which is moving really quickly now. Mercury is at 27 and a half degrees of Aquarius. And by the time we get to the 22nd, actually late in the day, um, almost midnight, Mercury actually moves into Pisces. Um, but this Venus-Mars conjunction, I think, is ultimately quite creative, and I think it's significant that both Venus and Mars are pushing towards squares to Jupiter. Um, they are exact on February 24th when Venus squares Jupiter and, um, and um, Mars squares Jupiter on the 27th. And again, I think we can be excited about the potential, but we have to be careful that we don't move too fast. Thankfully, we have the Sun and Mercury approaching Saturn, which I think acts as a little bit of a break as a governor, holding that speed of change down just enough while we figure out how we're going to manage this period of time. By the 23rd, we can see that Mercury now has moved into Pisces. Um, and, and again, Mercury in Pisces is a bit of the poet of the dreamer, but remember Mercury over the next several days will catch up not only to the sun, but to Saturn. And so again, we're having to make it real. We're having to be the realistic visionary rather than just the flagrant visionary that doesn't depend on anything real at all. On the 23rd, we also have the moon moving into Virgo. That's later in the day at 5.37 p.m. Um, by the 24th, we have Mercury having moved behind the sun. Um, Mercury moving into its half square to Chiron. Again, communication to solve the issues now is not as easy as it was when there were sextiles to Chiron. Right now, it's almost like everything we say, we our intentions, we can mean well, but somehow they just stir things up. And here we are approaching the full moon. That's exact um, uh, on the morning of the 24th. We can see the that the moon is full at five and a half degrees, actually five degrees uh, of Virgo and 23 minutes. I think 
What's significant here is that the full moon is right between Mercury and Saturn. It's pulling that energy in in a very powerful way. And, and although the exact conjunction between Mercury, the Sun, and Saturn um, don't occur for a couple of days, I think this full moon is a real turning point. At the same time, we have Venus now coming into um, the square to Jupiter. That's exact. Um, just a, a, well, it's exact later in the day um, at 8 p.m., but throughout the day, there's this whole tendency of wanting to take things too far, of if this is good, more is going to be better, which may not be true, especially since Venus is also making a half square with Neptune, which tells us that we're working a little bit on fantasy. Everything is looking a little bit better, or we're trying to turn things into a best case scenario, look for the spin doctors and making things look better than they are. That's the 25th. Um, early in the morning on the 26th, the moon moves into Libra. Um, as the moon moves into um, Libra, it begins to pick up on trines to the planet still remaining in Aquarius. They're not exact until later in the day um, on Monday and even into Tuesday morning. Um, but we also have on the 26th, we can feel now, Mars moving into that square to Jupiter. Remember, Venus squared Jupiter back on the 24th. Now, on the um, 27th, we have Mars squaring Jupiter just after midnight. We can feel that all day on the 26th. There's just that sense of too much is going on. There's, there, it's like enough's enough. Cool it. Slow it down. And on top of this, we now have the ability. There's something that is, in fact, the uh, the proverbial monkey wrench in the gears or the, the spanner in the works, if you're going to say it from the British English side. Um, that basically Mercury is moving toward its conjunction, its Kazemi with the Sun, as the Sun is moving with um, with the Kazemi with Saturn, because both Mercury is moving faster than the Sun, and the Sun moves faster than Saturn. And as we move to later on the 27th and on into early the 28th, we see that the Sun actually joins Mercury, and then Mercury joins Saturn and the Sun. If we move this ahead one day, we can see that that Mercury has basically whizzed past the Sun and Saturn, and Saturn is now on the other side of the, of um, Saturn still on the other side of the Sun. It'll take another day because the Sun Saturn conjunction doesn't occur. Um, until um, afternoon, but it's very close. Look how close it is here at noon. It's just within minutes um, of orb. That's what, one twentieth of a degree. So on February the 28th, we're really feeling the the restraint, the constraint, the seriousness, the it's not working. This is something holding back the change. Um, and yet this too shall pass because as Mercury and the Sun um, kind of separate from the conjunction with Saturn, um, I think we're going to feel some relief. But later in the day on, the, on, on Wednesday the 28th, we have the moon also entering Scorpio, and things do get very real, especially because as the moon enters Scorpio at 7.09 p.m., it's going to pick up on that square to Pluto once again and bring everything back around, rub salt on the wound, um, and um, and yet by early in the morning on the 29th, as we close out the month, we can see that the moon is in Scorpio, um, but we have Mercury now making a sextile to Jupiter. And in fact, that same sextile to Jupiter will happen um, in, in, in the first days of March as the sun makes its sextile to Jupiter. But what's important to understand is that because Jupiter's now moving faster than Saturn, it's moving away from that sextile that never quite happened. And so we're losing the opportunity that we had through the month of February when Jupiter and Saturn came so close to that sextile that there was cooperation between the expansion and contraction, between the opportunities of Saturn and the heart 
hard work, I'm sorry, between the opportunities of Jupiter and the hard work that we had to put in from Saturn. And it's like um, we're, we're past it and now we're going to have to make the best of whatever it is that we have, which brings us to the opening of March. And I know that was a bit of a rock and roll ride. There was so much going on, a lot of movement. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this month plays out. Um, and I will be back with the mid-month update for all of you who are on Patreon at the $3 a month level. If you're not and you want to get that mid-month update, go to patreon.com slash Rick Levine and sign up for the um, $3 a month level. That's the solar tier. Then you'll get the mid-month update. Otherwise, I'll see the rest of you for the forecast in March, and hopefully, I'll see some of you at the Whole Life or at the uh, Conscious Life Expo in LA, um, the February eighth, 9th, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth. Looking forward to it. And hold on to your hats, and remember: think cosmically, act locally. Because if we don't take care of business at home, <laughs> no one's going to take care of business for us on the cosmic level. I'm Rick Levine. Peace out.